Today's video offers a concise narrative spanning the entirety of the Bible, from the Adamic Age in the Old Testament to the final book of the New Testament. We will delve into the historical and archaeological layers, as well as explore the prophetic and doctrinal aspects of the Bible. From Adam in the Garden of Eden to the death of Jesus' disciples, this video promises to be transformative. Your appreciation for God's Word will undoubtedly deepen after watching it, provided you open your heart to its message. It all started at the Genesis, the timeless rock of ages preceding all, God, the eternal unceasing being existing from eternity past. He lacks origin or end. He is the source of all creation, the father of eternity, the creator that was not created, the creator of all things. In the Genesis account, God created the heavens and the earth, culminating in the creation of humanity, Adam and Eve made in his image. Initially perfect and in communion with God, they enjoyed stewardship over the Garden of Eden. Yet swayed by Satan's deception, they succumbed to sin, altering their relationship with God. The consequences of Adam and Eve's fall extended to all humanity, plunging them into a state of total depravity. As the progenitors of the human race, their sinful nature tainted the human race. Among their first two sons, Cain murdered his brother Abel due to jealousy, marking the first act of fratricide. Despite this tragedy, Adam and Eve had another son, Seth, from whom a lineage devoted to God emerged. Over the 930 years Adam lived on earth, Eve bore him many more sons and daughters. However, as time passed, wickedness and violence spread across the earth, illustrating the pervasive impact of sin. In response to the widespread wickedness on earth, God chose to cleanse the world through a flood. He found favor in Noah, a righteous man. God instructed Noah to build an ark in which Noah, his wife, and his three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, along with their wives, found refuge. Through Noah's family, God preserved the origin of different peoples. Shem, in particular, became the ancestor of the Semitic nations. Ham became the ancestor of African and Asian nations, while Japheth's descendants formed the foundation of European nations. Subsequently, God wanted to raise a people for himself, a people through whom the promised Messiah would emerge. He called out Abram from Ur of the Chaldeans, renamed him Abraham, which means the father of many nations. Abraham left his homeland and embarked on a journey of faith, becoming a devout pilgrim dedicated to God, a patriarch, and the epitome of faith. He erected altars to God wherever he journeyed. He left with nephew Lot, who later became the progenitor of these two nations, the Ammonites and the Moabites. Abraham started on his journey from Haran at the age of 75. God pledged to make him the father of many nations through his promised son, bringing blessings to all families of the earth. Abraham patiently awaited the fulfillment of God's promise for 11 years. However, Sarai, losing faith in God's word, alternatively offered her maidservant Hagar to Abraham, leading to the birth of Ishmael. Ishmael later became the progenitor of the Arab nations, historically known as adversaries of the people of Israel. At age 99, God made Abraham count the stars in the sky, promising him that his descendants would be as numerous as the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore. Alongside, God also revealed to Abraham that his descendants would be enslaved for a period spanning 430 years. When Abraham was 100 years, his wife Sarah, who was already 90 years old, gave birth to Isaac, their long-awaited promised son. Isaac grew up and married Rebekah, who was barren for 20 years, but eventually gave birth to twin sons Esau and Jacob. Esau went on to become the father of the Edomites. Jacob, whose name was later changed to Israel, became the patriarch of the Israelites. He had 12 sons and one daughter. Through his son Joseph, Jacob's family relocated to Egypt, initially numbering 70 individuals. Settling in the fertile land of Goshen, they experienced remarkable growth, multiplying significantly over 400 years. Under the leadership of Moses, they departed Egypt, comprising approximately 600,000 men, excluding women and children, totaling roughly 2 million people. The exodus led by Moses marked the beginning of the Israelites' journey. What should have taken about 11 days became a 40-year ordeal due to the people's disbelief and the negative report from 10 of the 12 spies sent to quote the promised land. 
their faithless and pessimistic feedback incited rebellion against God and Moses. When they described the inhabitants of the Promised Land as giants and themselves as grasshoppers, it revealed their lack of faith and trust in God. Consequently, God punished them severely, decreeing that all except Joshua and Caleb, the faithful spies, would perish in the wilderness. For 40 years, the Israelites wandered in circles in the desert. One year for each day, the land was spied out, resulting in the death of the entire generation of persons 20 years old and above, except for Joshua and Caleb, the two faithful servants. After 40 years of wandering, the Israelites began to take possession of the land promised to them. Under the leadership of Joshua, they spent six years conquering various territories. However, much of the land remained to be conquered. Joshua, who succeeded Moses, led the people into the Promised Land through divine calling and empowerment. Following Joshua's death, a period of 330 years known as the Era of the Judges commenced, characterized by theocratic rule. During this period of great moral and spiritual instability among the Israelites, the people lived according to their own desires, leading to oppression by numerous enemies due to the hardness of their hearts. However, amidst these challenges, God raised remarkable leaders of great stature, including Deborah, a renowned prophetess and judge, Gideon, known for his courageous faith, Samson, gifted with supernatural strength, Jephthah, a powerful leader, and Samuel, a revered prophet and judge. After this long period, a new phase came, the monarchy. In response to the people's desire for a king like the surrounding nations, Samuel, the last judge, anointed Saul as the first king of Israel. Saul's reign spanned 40 years, marked by both commendable beginnings and regrettable endings. However, his dynasty was cut short due to his imprudent action of offering incense to God without waiting for Samuel the prophet to arrive and perform the sacrifice as instructed by God. Following Saul's reign, God selected David as the ruler of Israel, where he reigned for 40 years. He moved the capital from Hebron to Jerusalem, establishing a prosperous kingdom. David's leadership was marked by military victories, spiritual devotion, and repentance for his sins. Despite his faults, he remained a man after God's own heart. God promised David eternal kingship for his descendants known as the Davidic Covenant. Jesus as the son of David fulfills this covenant, establishing an everlasting kingdom. Following David's reign, his son Solomon ascended to the throne and ruled for 40 years. Solomon sought wisdom from God, who granted him both wisdom and wealth. He was renowned for his wisdom, wealth, and the building of glorious temple of God in Jerusalem. He experienced peace throughout his reign. However, his numerous wives led to his heart being corrupted. It was only in his old age that Solomon turned to God and repented of his sins. Thus, the era of the United Kingdom of Israel and Judah lasted for 120 years. God granted the people's desire to have kings, but the people had to suffer the consequences of this unwise choice. After Solomon's death, the kingdom split because his son Rehoboam refused to heed the people's plea to ease the burdensome taxes. The opulent lifestyle of Solomon's reign relied heavily on the labor of the people who endured high taxation. However, after Solomon's death, his son Rehoboam refused to alleviate the tax burden, prompting ten of the twelve tribes to rebel against him. They rallied behind Jeroboam, establishing the northern kingdom with Samaria as its capital. Now the kingdom of Israel was split in two, with Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, as the king of Judah, and Jeroboam as the king of Israel. King Jeroboam used religion for political purpose, fearing that his subjects would seek Jerusalem to worship in the temple and become politically attracted to the kings of Judah. Jeroboam decided to build temples in the northern kingdom in Bethel, Gilgal, and Beersheba. In them, he placed a golden calf and induced the people to worship it as if it were God himself. This new northern kingdom endured for 209 years, led by 19 kings from eight different dynasties, none of whom were righteous. Over the course of 209 years, all 19 kings of Israel turned away from God and followed the ways of Jeroboam. During this time, God raised up different prophets like Amos, Hosea, and Micah to confront the nation's sins, from the rulers to the common people, and from the temples to the markets. 
They spoke out against political corruption, false religion, social injustice, and economic oppression, calling the people to repentance. Despite their efforts, the people refused to listen. Under Ahab's reign, influenced by his wife Jezebel, the worship of Baal, a Canaanite god associated with prosperity, spread throughout Israel. In that time, God appointed the prophet Elijah to expose and challenge the worship of the pagan deity Baal. After Elijah, Elisha was chosen to continue this remarkable ministry. Despite God's warnings, Israel refused to heed his voice. God's anger burned against Israel. He judged them by giving them to their enemies. He incited the Assyrians' invasion in Israel. Assyria, a ruthless empire known for its expansionism and brutality, inflicting atrocities and horrors on the defeated, often mutilating bodies and displaying heads as a sign of conquest. King Sargon II settled a mix of other peoples in the land of Israel, forming a great racial mixing there, weakening the potential existence of a people. The Samaritans emerged in Israel, becoming bitter enemies of the people of Judah. In the southern kingdom, whenever a righteous king ruled, the nation flourished in all aspects. Fulfilling the prophecy of the Messiah's lineage from the house of David, only one dynasty reigned. God raised several prophets to communicate his messages to the people of Judah. However, the nation fell into deep corruption, disregarding God's warnings. Consequently, God disciplined them by allowing the Babylonian army to conquer them, delivering them into the hands of their enemies. The Babylonian captivity marked the end of the southern kingdom of Judah, which lasted 345 years. Nebuchadnezzar's two invasions led to the destruction of Jerusalem, including its magnificent temple and the deportation of the people into captivity. They remained in exile for 70 years, fulfilling the prophecy delivered by the prophet Jeremiah. During the captivity, prophets like Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel emerged. This period led to the purification of the people from idolatry and the emergence of synagogues. When the appointed time came, the people of Judah returned to their land, as Babylon had already fallen to the Medo Persian Empire. Cyrus, foretold by God 200 years before he was born, liberated the Jewish people and facilitated their return to the land of Canaan. Returning from captivity, the Jewish people came back in three groups. Zerubbabel led the reconstruction of the temple. Ezra taught the law, and Nehemiah oversaw the rebuilding of the walls and the people's political and spiritual restructuring. However, they faced immediate challenges. The crafty Samaritans offered to help with the temple reconstruction, but their intentions were to disrupt the project. After their partnership offer was declined, the Samaritans escalated to threats. They wrote to King Artaxerxes, accusing the Jews of plotting against the Medo Persian kingdom. As a result of this malicious persecution, the temple construction was suspended for about 20 years. During this time, the people became lax in their dedication to the house of God. They shifted their focus to their personal affairs, constructing and embellishing their own homes while neglecting the dilapidated temple of God. In this period, God appointed prophets Haggai and Zechariah to urge the people to repent. Their message swiftly and deeply impacted the people, leading to repentance and a fervent return to complete the temple reconstruction. This sparked a significant spiritual revival, prompting restructuring within families and the priesthood, and a sincere return to devotion to God. After about a 100 years passed, a new generation emerged. Although they still went to the temple and made sacrifices, their reverence for God had diminished. They offered defective animals, showing disrespect for God's altar and considering it unworthy. The priests became corrupt, neglecting to teach the people God's word. This moral decline extended to family life, resulting in broken marriages and divorces. People no longer feared God's judgment, leading them to neglect their tithes. Despite their outward religious practices, they grew distant from God. In response, God raised up Malachi to call the people to repentance. This era marked the end of the Old Testament. The Old Testament concluded 400 years before Christ with the prophet Malachi. Then began the era of the intertestamental period or the period of prophetic silence. This era lasted about 400 years before the birth of Jesus Christ. During this period, non-canonical religious historical books, 
known as the Apocryphal Books, were authored. Additionally, the Old Testament underwent translation from Hebrew into Greek, resulting in the renowned Septuagint version. The Medo-Persian Empire succumbed to the Greek Empire led by Alexander the Great. Despite his conquest, Alexander passed away at the age of 33, lamenting the absence of new territories to conquer. His empire's expansion facilitated the spread of Hellenistic culture and the Greek language, paving the way for the widespread dissemination of the gospel in later years. Following Alexander's death, his kingdom was divided among four generals. During this era, the Egyptian Ptolemaics and the Syrian Seleucids exerted significant influence, often engaged in conflict. Israel found itself under the dominance of either power at different times. Antiochus Epiphanes further aggravated tensions by sacrilegiously offering a pig on the temple altar in Jerusalem, inciting outrage among the Jews. This act ignited the Maccabean Revolt, eventually won by Judas Maccabeus after a prolonged and bloody struggle. In 63 BC, Jerusalem fell to Pompey, marking the beginning of Roman rule in Israel. Herod the Great ascended to power. Known for his administrative prowess, he expanded and beautified the temple in Jerusalem, constructed Caesarea's port to facilitate trade and missionary journeys, erected Masada Fortress, and built numerous palaces and fortifications. However, Herod was a highly insecure man. His obsession with maintaining his throne haunted him, leading to extreme measures. He entered into multiple marriages and fathered numerous children. When he wed Mariamna, a woman of noble birth, he executed all aristocrats in her family, fearing threats to his reign. He appointed his 17-year-old nephew, Archelos, as high priest of Jerusalem at his mother-in-law's urging. However, threatened by Archelos's popularity, Herod ordered his nephew's assassination. His mother-in-law, afraid for her life, fled to Egypt, but Herod sent his emissaries after her and assassinated her. Caesar Augustus summoned him to Rome to answer for his atrocities. Prior to his departure, he had his wife Mariamna executed out of concern that she might plot against him in his absence. Later, he sent two of his sons to Rome for education. His sister Salome expected that they would return more prepared to take the throne. Herod did not hesitate. He ordered his two sons to be strangled. Before his death, he made his sister Salome vow to execute at least one nobleman from every Jerusalem family to ensure tears at his funeral. This was the same man who grew alarmed upon learning from the wise men that a boy had been born in Judea to be the king of Israel. After Herod died, his kingdom was partitioned among four of his sons. Archelaus, ruling over Judea, Samaria, and Edom, proved to be a tyrannical ruler. Eventually, the Jews appealed to the Romans to depose him. Concerned about the ongoing unrest in Judea, Rome appointed a Roman procurator or governor to oversee the region marking the beginning of direct Roman rule over Judea. Pilate served as the governor during that period. The dire political circumstances faced by the chosen people of God, the oppression by the despotic rule of the Herodians and subjected to Roman domination intensified the longing for the Messiah's arrival as never before. It became a fervent plea for liberation and redemption from oppressive bondage. It was precisely during this pivotal moment that Jesus, fulfilling biblical prophecies and arriving at the appointed time, was born in Bethlehem of Judea. The eternal word became incarnate and dwelled among humanity. He resided among us, abounding in grace and truth. He clothed himself in human form, donned the sandals of humility, traversed our earth, partook of our sufferings, shared in our joys and sorrows, shed tears alongside us, bore our sins upon the cross, died and resurrected on the third day, Jesus rose in glory. He redeemed the human race back to God with his blood shed on the cross. Both Hellenistic and Roman cultures played a role alongside the Jewish contribution to the advent of the Messiah in the world. Fleeing from the persecution of King Herod, Joseph and Mary sought refuge in Egypt with baby Jesus. They stayed there until the death of Herod, the tyrant king. Upon their return, they resettled in Nazareth, their former city of residence. It was there that Jesus matured under the guidance of his father Joseph, a carpenter. Then, at age 30, Jesus started his ministry. Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist in the Jordan River. 
Immediately after his baptism, as he prayed, the heavens opened and the Holy Spirit descended upon him in the form of a dove. A voice from heaven proclaimed, You are my beloved Son, with you I am well pleased. This marked the moment when the Holy Spirit empowered Jesus to commence his ministry. Subsequently, led by the Holy Spirit, Jesus journeyed into the desert, where he fasted for 40 days and nights, preparing for the challenges ahead. Throughout his 40-day fast in the desert, Jesus faced three temptations from the devil. However, he overcame each temptation by responding with Scripture, wielding the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Unlike the first Adam who succumbed to deception and defeat in the Garden of Eden, Jesus, the second and final Adam, emerged victorious over the devil in the desert. Filled with the Holy Spirit, Jesus departed from the desert and journeyed to Galilee. He eventually arrived in Nazareth, where he spent the majority of his earthly life. Entering the synagogue, Jesus took the scroll of the book of Isaiah and read, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach, to heal and to deliver. He appointed 12 men as apostles, dedicating much of his time to their training and discipleship. Jesus embarked on extensive travels, traversing Galilee, Perea, Samaria and Judea. He preached in various settings, including cities, villages and fields, as well as synagogues and the temple. His ministry extended outdoors to the beach and into homes, addressing both large crowds and intimate gatherings. Jesus went everywhere doing good and delivering all those oppressed by the devil. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, restored sight to the blind, strengthened the paralyzed, enabled the lame to walk, restored hearing to the deaf, cleansed lepers, liberated the possessed, and even raised the dead. Emmanuel, God with us. He is the very embodiment of God in human form. Jesus' mission was defined. He came with a defined mission for all those to whom the Father gave him to be saved. He was born to die. He died so that we could live. The Apostle Paul was emphatic when he said that Jesus died for our sins, was buried and rose again on the third day. His death was not an accident, nor was his resurrection a surprise. The devil was completely taken off guard. Jesus' death on the cross was a punch the devil never saw coming. On the cross, Jesus crushed the serpent's head. By his death on the cross, Jesus triumphed over principalities and powers. Having disarmed them, he made a public spectacle of them. On the cross, Jesus completed the work of redemption, liberating us from bondage. Death couldn't hold him back. On the third day, Jesus rose again, securing our justification. Before ascending to heaven, Jesus instructed his disciples to tarry in Jerusalem, awaiting the Father's promise of sending them the Helper, who is the Holy Spirit, who would empower them. This empowerment was to equip them to be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth, as outlined in Acts 1, 8. After the Holy Spirit descended on the apostles on the day of Pentecost, the church experienced explosive growth in Jerusalem, marking an astonishing expansion. Multitudes were consistently joining the church, and Luke documents the growth and expansion of the Jerusalem church up to Acts chapter 7. However, since the church's influence remained confined to Judea, God allowed persecution, causing believers to scatter and spread the word wherever they went. This scattering led Philip to Samaria, where he effectively preached the gospel, breaking through the walls of enmity and preaching the gospel there with power. The people rejoiced to hear and see the things that God did through Philip. Many miracles were performed, deaf ears were healed, the blind received their sight, through the laying on of hands, Samaritans also received the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues when Apostle Peter and John laid hands on them. The gospel spread beyond the borders of Israel with the conversion of the persecutor of the church, Saul of Tarsus, on the road to Damascus. After Saul's repentance, his name was changed to Paul, and he emerged as a key figure in cultural missions. Following this transformation, Paul, along with Barnabas, embarked on their first missionary journey through the regions of Galatia, journeying through places like Perga, Derby, Iconium and Lystra. Along the way, they established churches and appointed elders. On their second missionary journey, Paul, accompanied by Silas, ventured into the provinces of Macedonia and Achaia, where they founded churches in cities such as Philippi, Thessalonica, 
Berea and Corinth. Starting from Syrian Antioch, Paul wrote the letter addressed to the Galatians, Corinthians, and two letters for the Thessalonians. During his third missionary journey, Paul journeyed to Asia Minor, where he spent roughly three years in Ephesus, the provincial capital. It was from Ephesus that he penned the two letters to the Corinthian congregation. Ephesus, a cosmopolitan city boasting over 300,000 residents, was home to the temple of the goddess Diana. During Paul's time in Asia Minor, numerous churches were established across the province, including those in Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea, Colossae, and Hierapolis. Additionally, there was a significant event during Emperor Claudius's reign when a widespread famine occurred, leading to the expulsion of Jews from Rome, as documented in the Book of Acts, chapter 18, verse 2. Paul, motivated by his concern for the poor in Judea, organized a substantial collection among the Gentile churches to assist them. Despite being warned by the prophet Agabus about the dangers awaiting him in Jerusalem, Paul remained steadfast in his commitment to proclaiming the gospel of God's grace, prioritizing his ministry over personal safety. Before setting off for Jerusalem, he wrote his comprehensive epistle, the letter to the Romans, expressing his longing to visit the capital of the empire and to share the word with the church there, with the eventual goal of being sent by them to Spain. Shortly after Paul reached Jerusalem, he was apprehended within the temple precincts, specifically in the Gentile court. He was then transported to Caesarea, where he faced accusations from the Jews for two years under the governance of Felix and Festus. Faced with Festus's inclination to hand him over to the Sanhedrin, who sought his demise, Paul invoked his Roman citizenship privileges and opted for trial in Rome. During the voyage to Rome, the capital of the empire, Paul encountered a harrowing shipwreck. Despite the ship being utterly destroyed, all passengers and crew miraculously survived, fulfilling God's promise to Paul. Upon reaching the island of Malta, where they were stranded, Paul was bitten by a viper, but God neutralized the venom's deadly effects. Furthermore, God worked through Paul to heal all the sick individuals on the island. The Maltese provided for all of Paul's needs as he journeyed to Rome. Upon arrival, he spent two years under house arrest in a rented house. During this time, Paul continued his ministry by evangelizing the Praetorian Guard, encouraging believers to work diligently, and composing letters to the Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. Following his release, Paul wrote the first letter to Timothy and the letter to Titus. However, starting from the year 64 AD, the persecution against the church shifted from being purely religious to becoming politically motivated. During this time, Paul found himself back in prison, confined to a dungeon. A grim, dank and unhealthy underground cell. On the 17th of July in the year 64 AD, the city of Rome, boasting a population of over a million people, was engulfed in flames. Emperor Nero, disguised as an actor, ascended to the top of the Tower of Metinus, overseeing the breathtaking spectacle of the inferno consuming the city. The blaze lasted for seven nights and six days, resulting in the destruction of 70% of the city. Out of the 14 districts in Rome, 10 lay in ruins. Nero exploited this catastrophe to scapegoat Christians for the fire, especially targeting the four districts densely populated by Jews and Christians. This marked the onset of a vicious persecution against the church. Due to the overwhelming number of believers being crucified, there was a shortage of wood for making crosses. Instead, believers were bound to poles coated in pitch and burnt alive to serve as human torches for the nighttime entertainment of the Knights of Rome. It was a horrific massacre. It was from this second imprisonment that Paul penned his final epistle, the second letter to Timothy. In it, he recounted the imminent approach of his own martyrdom and expressed the glorious anticipation of receiving the crown of righteousness. Thus, around the year AD 67, the esteemed Apostle Paul was executed by beheading, yet he left behind a blessed legacy for future generations. The New Testament was written over a span of 50 years. 
It comprises four narrative accounts known as the Gospels, with three of them, Matthew, Mark and Luke, being synoptic, meaning they share a similar perspective and structure. Matthew's primary focus is to present Jesus as the King of the Jews, making it tailored for a Jewish audience. It contains the largest number of Old Testament quotations and is considered the most Jewish of the Gospels. Mark, on the other hand, emphasizes Jesus as a servant, targeting a Roman audience. It emphasizes Jesus' actions more than his teachings. Luke's Gospel highlights Jesus as the Son of Man intended for a Greek audience. It was authored by Luke, a Gentile doctor, historian and traveller, and aims to portray Jesus as the perfect man. Consequently, Luke extensively covers Jesus' prayer life and ministry, empowered by the Holy Spirit. In contrast, John's Gospel, written towards the end of the first century to combat Gnosticism, refutes the heresy denying Christ's divinity. John's approach focuses on proving Jesus as both fully God and fully man. He does this by selecting seven miracles and seven I am statements attributed to Jesus, demonstrating his divine nature. In addition to the Gospels, we have the Acts of the Apostles, which document the early history of the Church from its inception to its spread to the city of Rome. Three key churches played significant roles in this expansion, Jerusalem, Antioch and Ephesus. The Church's influence extended to four provinces of the Roman Empire – Galatia, Macedonia, Achaia and Asia Minor. Notably, the Book of Acts lacks a definitive conclusion, reflecting the ongoing narrative of the Church's journey. As believers, we are heirs and participants in the ongoing story of the Church that began at Pentecost. Additionally, we have Apostle Paul's epistles addressed to the Churches in Rome, Galatia, Ephesus, Philippi, Colossae and Thessalonica along with his personal letters to Timothy, Titus and Philemon. Furthermore, there exists a letter written to Jewish believers facing temptation amidst persecution, urging them to remain steadfast in their faith. This letter, known as Hebrews, was authored by an unidentified writer. We also have the general letters written by James, Peter, John and Jude. Lastly, we have an eschatological book, the Book of Revelation. This book documents the glorious triumph of Christ and his church. This was authored by the Apostle John while exiled on the island of Patmos around the year 96 AD. That brings us to the end of this video. I hope you have learnt something here today. Please like this video and subscribe to our channel here on YouTube. Most importantly, if you have not yet accepted Jesus as your Lord and Saviour, there is still time to repent now. Dear Beloved, in the boundless love of God, our Heavenly Father, He sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to die for us, offering redemption, salvation, and a transformed life. If you haven't accepted Jesus, you can do so by repeating these words after me wholeheartedly. Heavenly Father, I thank You for loving me so much that You sent Your Son, Jesus Christ, to this earth to die for my sins. Jesus, come into my heart today. I accept You as my Lord and Saviour. Father God, I give You all the glory. Thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name, amen. Embrace this new journey of faith, walking in the light of God's love.